and welcome back to the Unseen Podcast, a podcast dedicated to missing people, unresolved cases and UK true crime. Today we're going to be exploring the disappearance of 34-year-old Marion Hodge in Dumfries in Scotland in 1984. Her disappearance has become cold over the years, however the theories surrounding what happened haven't stopped circulating. This episode is about a missing person and does not contain any graphic descriptions. However, as always, listener discretion is advised. Belgray is located in the town of Lockerbie, in the wider council area of Dumfries and Galloway. It's close to the English border and around 75 miles away from Glasgow. Lockerbie is small, with just over 4,000 residents. However, it became internationally known in 1988 when a bomb exploded on Pan Am Flight 103. The plane landed in the town, killing 11 of the residents as well as all 259 plane passengers. It also damaged many of the buildings. The Lockerbie disaster was devastating for all involved and the residents of Lockerbie became part of the rescue effort. The Dumfries and Galloway Constabulary established that two Libyan nationals were responsible for the bomb. In 2003, Libyan leader Muammar Gaddafi accepted responsibility for the bomb. Going into the 1990s, this was what many people knew Lockerbie for. However, prior to that, it was a fairly peaceful place to live. It was here that Marion Hodge lived in 1984. Marion had grown up in Lockerbie along with her four siblings and was known to be outgoing and intelligent. Her sister Frances later explained a bit about Marion growing up. She said, Marion did well at school and liked sports and singing. She was voted Gala Queen at Lockerbie when she was 15. She could have gone on to further education, but got engaged at 18, then married and became a mother at 19. She took to motherhood, running a house and was devoted to her children. Marion became a relatively young wife and mother, however she embraced these roles and did everything for her children. She would go on to have two children, Catherine and Robert, with her husband Bill and has been described as a devoted mother. Marion also cared about her career and began working as a clerk at the Clydesdale Bank in Lockerbie. This was a job that she enjoyed and took pride in. She had been working on the day that William Vary entered the branch with a sawn-off shotgun and committed armed robbery. While this must have been a scary experience, it did not deter Marion from doing the job, and she continued working there. By 1984, when Marion was 34 years old, she was an experienced clerk and knew the job well. July 6th, 1984 was Marion's son Robert's 15th birthday, and should have been a day of celebration for the family. It was on this day, however, that her family and friends discovered that Marion was nowhere to be seen. Marion's husband, Bill, simply provided her family with a strange explanation and set of events. He explained that on the evening of the 5th, Marion had told him that she was leaving him, and the next morning asked him to drop her off at a bus station in White Sands, around 25 minutes from their home. He explained that he did do this and dropped her off at the bus station at around 8am that morning. Since that time, nobody had seen Marion and she never came back home to see her son on his birthday. For Marion's family this was extremely out of character and the fact that she didn't tell anyone where she was going and simply upped and left was not like her. All of them were baffled that Marion would do such a thing and couldn't believe it. Marion's brother Robert later explained, She was a very straightforward person. I could always trust her. She was grounded and would never have left her children. It was her son Bobby's 15th birthday. Marion would have got in touch with us, her family. She would have explained the situation and there would have been no mystery. She was not a mysterious person. 
police were notified of Marion's disappearance and began to look into the timeline of events. As Marion's husband Bill had explained that he dropped her off at the bus station at just before 8am, officers canvassed the station to see if anyone, passengers, bus drivers or other workers, remembered seeing her that morning. They couldn't find anyone who saw her or could help with the investigation. This was strange given that this was a time when people were travelling and may well have been out and about heading to work. After being dropped off, Marion's bank records show that her cash line account was accessed at a cash machine. From information provided by Bill, it was thought that she already had around £1,000 in cash with her when she left. However, the records showed that someone had withdrawn £100 about an hour after she'd been dropped at the bus station. While this could have corroborated the fact that Marion needed the money to leave her life, there was an odd detail about this transaction that her family couldn't get past. When the transaction was made, the PIN number had been put in incorrectly twice before eventually being put in correctly. This seemed extremely odd to her family who couldn't understand why she would have made this mistake. Her brother Robert has since commented, When the police told us her bank PIN number had been wrongly put in twice, I knew then it was the killer trying to convince everyone Marion had left of her own free will. She worked in a bank. She would never have made three attempts to enter her PIN. Her brother went further to say that this is something else that convinced him that she had been murdered, saying, I've no doubt my sister was murdered on the day that she disappeared. Along with the information about the incorrect PIN number, there was more to the story than originally met the eye. It would emerge that there were some events that preceded Marion's disappearance. On the night of the 5th of July, Bill would later state that he and Marion had been having an argument. Bill had accused Marion of having an affair with one of their good friends, local businessman Bill Wells. Bill Wells was spoken to about the interaction he had with Marion's husband that night. He told a newspaper at the time, Certainly her husband came to see me the night before she disappeared and asked if we were having an affair, but I told him the same thing. There was nothing between us. We were not having an affair. If we had have been, don't you think she would have been in touch with me? An image started to emerge of Marion and Bill arguing, and this is the reason that Bill gave that Marion decided to leave the next morning. It wasn't until three days after her disappearance that she was reported missing. Her family weren't convinced that she would have left willingly, and the fact that she didn't contact anyone after she was dropped off at the bus station was a real concern. Four days after she disappeared, a strange phone call from a man purporting to be relaying a message from Marion was received by one of Marion's colleagues, Colin Barber. Colin's brother Robert answered the phone as he was out. Robert later explained that the man on the other end of the line had a local accent and told him that Marion was okay, but that she wouldn't be returning to work. Robert described the call as very strange and wasn't sure what to think. After Marion's disappearance was reported, the police began trying to trace where she might be or what might have happened. Officers attempted to track down any witnesses that might have noticed Marion that morning and issued a description of what she was last seen wearing. She was reportedly last seen wearing a cream, high-collared blouse, grey skirt and black sandals. She was also carrying a brown handbag and a blue canvas suitcase. Officers struggled to find anyone who had spotted her that morning and couldn't establish that this is where she had even been. Local areas were searched and no sign of Marion nor any of her belongings were found in any of the areas that were investigated. As weeks passed, Marion still had not returned and both her family and the police were more and more worried and convinced that something must have happened. Eleven weeks after her disappearance, Detective Inspector Jimmy Gilchrist, who was in charge of the investigation, 
stated to the media. In view of extensive inquiries and the time that has elapsed, we are now very concerned for her well-being. Another thing that was worrying was the lack of any activity on her bank account since the day that she disappeared. Despite reportedly having a thousand pounds and taking out another hundred from her bank account that day, she had not taken out any more money since then, and eleven weeks later, this money would have ran out. If she hadn't taken out any money, then what was she living on? Checks of all other accounts such as any use of medical services or employment also drew a blank, so if she had decided to voluntarily disappear, where was she and why was there no record of her? The fact that police could find no trace of Marion was a huge concern and they appealed on Crime Watch for any information that could lead to her discovery. Her family, including her mother Agnes and father Robert, were convinced that something more sinister must have happened to Marion. And while police also agreed that something didn't seem right about the case, they couldn't progress any further in establishing where she might be. Over the years that followed, lines of inquiry were followed up on, but Marion was still not found. She missed several of her children's birthdays and family events something which she would not have done and was extremely out of character. In 1992, eight years after her disappearance, Marion's husband Bill filed an application with the Court of Session to have her officially declared dead. While this is something that many relatives of missing people do to try and sort out their own affairs after significant time has elapsed, Marion's family did not agree with his decision. Her parents attempted to try and delay this ruling and gave a reason why. They believed that Bill had killed Marion. The suspicion had fallen on Bill as he was the last person to see Marion alive and they had had an argument the night before she disappeared. This was of course corroborated by the fact that he had rang up Bill Wells to confront him. Marion's brother Robert later told the Scottish son, saying for Marion, it was so out of character, she was not an ambitious person, she was quite happy. Talking about Bill, he said, her husband was the complete opposite, the grass was always greener. There was never a whiff of scandal about Marion. The family questioned Bill's involvement in her disappearance and didn't want her to be ruled officially deceased for this reason, along with the pain that it obviously brought them. The Court of Session did accept the application and Marion was ruled officially dead in 1992. That now begged the question though, if Marion was no longer alive, where was she and why was there no record of her living anywhere in the intervening years? Three years after Marion disappeared, Bill met another woman named Penny, who he went on to marry in 1992 after Marion was declared dead. This marriage ended in 2014, when Bill reportedly walked out on Penny. Between these years, however, there was some movement on Marion's case. In 2006, the Dumfries and Galloway police declared Marion's disappearance no longer a missing person case. It was now a murder investigation. Her family praised this decision, saying that they were sure that after all this time had passed, something must have happened to Marion. They began a reinvestigation into the case, and that same year it was reported that a man had been detained for questioning about the murder. This man was eventually released without charge, and no more information could be publicised. Police stated that new evidence had been found, but that they were still unable to find her body. The details about the new evidence are unclear, as is the reason for the man's arrest. More appeals were made in the hope that this would lead to finding out the truth, but sadly, more time has since passed with no answers. In 2017, Bill's ex-wife Penny spoke to the Scottish son and talked about him and their life together. She said he would never talk about the case, never. But towards the end, while he was having cancer treatment, there were things about him that changed his mentality. 
It was all odd. There was nothing ever said that you could go to the police over, but they did question me about 12 months ago and I gave a statement. I think I had a lucky escape. I've seen his temper flare. If he was angry with the horses, he would just about knock their heads off. I'm an animal lover and I don't like that. This information given by an ex-partner can't be relied upon and there has been no information released that confirms that Bill had any involvement with Marion's disappearance. Marion's family still remains steadfast in their opinion that something happened to her. In March this year, Dumfries and Galloway Police reopened Marion's case and appealed for any witnesses to come forward to help the investigation. Detective Inspector Stephen McGrath told the press, We're appealing to anyone who remembers anything unusual leading up to Marion's disappearance. Any sightings in the White Sands area or any other relevant information that might help our inquiry. The case was featured on Crime Watch to try and jog people's memories from almost 40 years ago. DI Stephen McGrath stated the response to the appeal has been positive, but they needed more information. They also encouraged people to leave tips on a new online portal. Marion's case is now being reinvestigated, and there is hope that someone will come forward with much needed information. It's clear that harm came to Marion, but where is her body? What really happened to her? Marion's family have welcomed the reinvestigation and hope they will get answers despite the fact that her parents have now passed away. Marion's brother Robert echoed the appeal made by the police and hopes that his sister can finally get some justice. He stated to the Daily Record, It's been terrible not knowing what happened to my sister and where she is buried. I just hope that anyone who knows anything that could help police and bring her killer to justice will have a shred of decency and tell what they know. I refuse to believe my sister is living somewhere else and didn't contact her family. My parents died heartbroken. I want to see justice for my sister. If you know anything about the disappearance of Marion Hodge, then you are encouraged to contact the dedicated inquiry team on 0141 305 4551 or Police Scotland on 101. Thank you for listening to today's episode. I was recently a guest on the Crime Lines podcast where I spoke to the host Charlie about the Shannon Matthews case. I love Crime Lines and was so excited to speak to Charlie. If you're interested, head over and have a listen to the episode about Shannon Matthews' disappearance and then the after show where I'm a guest. I will leave the link in the show notes. Thank you as always to our patrons for supporting the show. If you'd like to get access to bonus episodes as voted by you, early access to ad-free episodes and stickers and shoutouts, then head over to the link in the show notes to become a patron. You can also further support the podcast by reviewing it wherever you listen, including Spotify, or you can simply share the episodes. Find me on social media on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter and if you want to send me any suggestions or comments then you can at theunseenpod at gmail.com. As always, I'm Caprice and this has been Unseen. <laughs>